but before I do, um, okay, good, we're recording. Uh, before I introduce Ted, uh, uh, ask the attendees to do two things. Uh, please make sure that your microphone is muted so there won't be any interruptions tonight. And uh, also, it will help to turn off your cameras, your videos to save bandwidth during, uh, during Ted's presentation. So anyway, if you can do that, I would appreciate it. So with that said, 13 years ago, 2009, I was first introduced to Ted McRae by the long-term MES member, Frank Guarneri. And at the time, Ted authored an article for the Maryland entomologist on beetles of the genus, and I'll probably mispronounce this, Purpurocinus, is that close? That sounds good to me. <laughs> that occur in Maryland. Okay. <laughs> At the same time, Ted also became a member of MES. He told me that he greatly appreciated these smaller local journals, such as the Maryland Entomologist. So since then, I've corresponded with Ted many times by email, and uh, he's served as a peer reviewer for our journal, as well as a source uh, for me for other finding other experts on various taxa that I could contact for doing peer reviews. Uh, and since Ted serves as the managing editor for Pan Pacific Entomologist, the review editor for the Coleopterus Bulletin, and the review layout editor for Cisindella, he has always graciously, graciously answered any of my editorial questions that have arisen over the years. Ted's been fasc fascinated with insect natural history all of his life. He recently retired after a 40 year career as a research entomologist in agricultural bio biotechnology. He's traveled extensively across the US and many other countries. His insect collection has more than 100,000 specimens, which is, that's amazing. Uh, he's published numerous papers on beetles, primarily on taxonomy, distribution and host associations. And more recently, he has written about his surveys to assess the conservation status of the Missouri tiger beetle species. And that's basically what this talk is concentrated on tonight. Uh, Ted's an excellent photographer with an emphasis on field photography of non-captive insects. And lastly, if you've never visited Ted's website, Beetles in the Bush, it contains a wealth of information about beetles and it's just one word, beetlesinthebush.com. So with that all said, I will turn it over to Ted and we can get started. Well, thank you, Gene. Um, I enjoyed that introduction. Uh, thank you for the invitation, uh, Fred also. Um, I'm always happy to uh, talk about beetles um, to anybody that's willing to listen, but um, I have a special place in my heart for tiger beetles. They're, they're not the first group I picked up on. Uh, my, my, really my primary, uh, the focus of my, my studies uh, from more of a taxonomic standpoint are the um, wood boring beetles, especially um, uh, jewel beetles, Bupressidae. Um, but I got into tiger beetles about 20 years ago as a result of an invitation from one of our state conservation officials who asked me to write, if I could write a, an article on, on uh, tiger beetles um, of Missouri for for their publication, the Missouri Conservationist. And uh, I'd always picked them up, you know, when I was out, I, I liked them. And uh, that kind of motivated me to jump a little bit more into them. And um, of course, it seems like as with most things that I get into, I kind of really get into them. So um, that, that started um, an effort over the past 20 years, um, working closely with another colleague of mine, Christopher Brown, who who um, who put this to, uh, presentation together with me? But we've been uh, we've been together. We've been studying the tiger beetles of Missouri for the past twenty years. Our initial goal was to develop a um, a faunal checklist to understand their distributions in the state, uh, their seasonal and temporal uh, their temporal and um, spatial occurrence. Uh, and then, of course, as we encountered some of these more restricted um, and questionable species, uh, we got more and more interested in their actual conservation status, which is um, uh, 
something that's that's hard to do in a lot of insect groups because we just don't even know enough about them to know if they do have a conservation status. So um, I like I like talking about tiger beetles because it, it kind of forms a bridge between the 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 more serious study of um, of beetles from a taxonomic standpoint um, to the citizen scientist aspect. Um, I, I do consider myself a citizen scientist, even though I, I work professionally as an entomologist. Um, but I see th this work on tiger beetles is really more of a from an avocational standpoint, and um, uh, I think it's a lot. Of, uh, it's something that that a lot of other non-specialists can can easily get into as well. And so, hopefully, uh, my talk here and other places will will prompt that kind of interest. So I'm sure everybody um, here knows what tiger beetles are, but um, maybe have not seen them up close and personal. Um, it, they're, they're, they're pretty charismatic insects, um, pretty charismatic beetles. They have, you know, they're predators. So they have um, uh, mandibles for catching and chewing up prey. And uh, uh, most of them are able to run uh, quite fast. And so that's, uh, those are perfect tools for, for predators to have. But along with that, that, that predatory behavior, they have a lot of other behaviors that, um, that make them quite charismatic, um, especially with their thermal regulatory behaviors. Uh, and then combine that with, with the, um, it, with some species, pretty, the pretty extreme habitat specificity that they display um, really makes them uh, interesting field sub, uh, subjects for study. So the basics of tiger beetle identification um, in the field, uh, they, they have these features that, um, that oftentimes allow them to be identified to species with a fair degree of, of certainty out in the field, which really facilitates doing uh, surveys uh, for them and occurrence and uh, without the requirement to collect specimens and and uh, and look at them under the scope to make sure that you know what species you're talking about. Uh, these identification features basically revolve around uh, their ground color, relative size, and shape. Also, you know the habitats that you find them in, because these are, uh, of course, quite um, habitat specific. And then they have this these series of uh, markings on their elytra. Uh, the humeral lunule, the middle band, and the apical lunule, and those combination of features often uh, allow them to be identified with a fair degree of confidence. In Missouri, so so Missouri, you know, we sit right in the middle of the continent, and and uh, so as would be expected, it's kind of an ecotonal position between the north and the south, and between the east and the west. And if you look at the composition of the fauna. Uh, you can see there's a large part that comes from east of the Rocky Mountains, but we also have a significant portion of species derived from the Great Plains in the central U.S. and then a few, and then a few boreal and, and southeastern species. But but when you look at Missouri, that kind of makes sense because we have this uh, this Ozark Plateau, which is the 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 only significantly elevated landform between the Appalachians and the Rocky Mountains. That's a very old landform. Uh, it's been, it's, it's one of the most continuously um, exposed, uh, in other words, not covered by oceans uh, on the continent. And uh, it's mostly uh, oak, oak hickory forest. The, but then we have this, um, this area in the west central part of the state that represents part of the unglaciated, um, the unglaciated plains. Uh, it's, um, there's some tall grass prairie room that's there. We have a large uh, portion of the north of the Missouri River, which basically represents the southern extent, uh, the southern extent of the, uh, the the last glaciation, and so these would be called the glaciated plains. And we have a very unique physiogeographic region in the extreme southeast portion of the state that's referred to colloquially as as the boot heel because it looks like a boot heel. But um, where'd my cursor go? There it is. Uh, but these are, this is the very northern tip of the Mississippi uh, lowlands. The, it's, uh, it's extension of the, uh, the, the, the lowlands from the, from the Gulf of Mexico up to its northern terminus here. And it's, uh, it's quite a different um, region and we'll see its importance 
uh, a little bit later in the talk. As far as where tiger beetles live, um, uh, again, um, almost every habitat harbors some type of target be tiger beetle, but within those habitats, the, the tiger beetles can be quite specific about what it is they're looking for. We have a variety of habitats here in Missouri. Um, some of the more interesting ones would be uh, would be these uh, uh, so-called glades. These are more properly called xeric prairies. Um, they can be either on a limestone base or a, or a sandstone base, and that affects um, the, the kind of plants that grow there, but there are some uh, species that are restricted to those habitats. Sand prairies as well. Um, sand is a pretty rare commodity in Missouri, except along the the, um, the, uh, the big rivers, um, but dry sand is, is quite rare. And there's some species that, uh, that really like that. Um, and, and the Lus Hills is a, a, a very unique region up in the Northwestern corner of the state where we have some species restricted just to that part of the state. So the, this chart is, um, it's something that I put together for a group of species out in New Mexico. It's not really um, representative of Missouri species, but it does represent what can happen with any, any particular habitat that is inhabited by tiger beetles. Even within that one habitat, you can have a number of species living there and they coexist because they partition that habitat uh, into further smaller niches. So for example, in this situation here, we have we have several species that, that are found pretty much in the drier zones and even along the roadside. Um, and then you get other species that are, they may get up into the dry sand, but they, they also tolerate the moist sand. And then, and then some that, that, that they need that moisture. And the, the moist sand is as far away from the water that they'll get, but they'll even get into the, into the wet mud. And some that, that really just like to stay right around the water's edge though. So it allows for a number of species to utilize uh, the same habitat. This is a quick overview of all of the tiger beetles that we've found, the, the tiger beetle species that we've found in Missouri. Uh, we've ended up with 24 species. Um, two of those were new state records. And, um, and a number of them that we, we eventually determined that they had some conservation um, significance that warranted further study. And I'll talk a little bit more about that um, in the rest of the talk. Um, but I've, um, for those of you in Maryland, I've outlined those species in red that we do share in common. Um, I think when I counted this up, it was 14 of the 24 uh, that we do share in common. So, um, so while we do have a number of species that we do share, there's, there's, there are quite a few species out here that um, do not get too much further east of here. And this uh, generally reflects the, uh, uh, the Plains influence that we have in, in Missouri. So this is Missouri. And I'm gonna give you a quick overview of the species of conservation concern that we ended up looking at a little bit more closely. Uh, the first one is um, the ascendant tiger beetle, tri uh, Cisandella, um, Tri, I think that should be uh, trifasciata ascendants, not the other way around. And um, as far as we know, that's that's just a a vagrant individual that that um, that came in. It's not not representative of, of an established population. But we'll, we'll take a little bit closer look at that. Um, down in the boot heel area that I mentioned earlier, we have the ant-like tiger beetle. That's um, uh, Cylindra cursitans. And uh, that's a species that we did do some pretty detailed uh, surveys to, to determine its conservation status. Likewise, with the, um, the saline spring tiger beetle, uh, you notice know circumpictum uh, johnsonii. That's a, um, uh, it's a, the, the species is quite widespread in the Great Plains, but this population in Missouri represents a disjunct population uh, that is quite well separated from the main population further west. Uh, another disjunct population that we have in Missouri is the prairie tiger beetle, uh, Cisandolidia obsoleta vulturina. Uh, that species is much more um, typical of the, of, 
of the Southwest and up into Colorado and Western Oklahoma. Again, this population here is disjunct and there's some, some quite interesting features about it because of that, that disjunct nature. And then one more disjunct here in, um, in West Central Missouri, uh, Dromochorus pruinina, the frosted Droma tiger beetle. Uh, again, that's a, that's a species that we looked at um, quite closely to determine its status in the state. And then finally, up in northwestern Missouri, we have Cylindra solaripes, uh, closely related to the um, ant-like tiger beetle, Cursitans, uh, very similar in many respects, but also quite different. And um, I'll talk a little bit more about that one. And then finally, the, uh, the ghost tiger beetle, uh, uh, Ellipsoptera lepida, which is kind of widespread along the big river valleys, which is basically the Missouri River, and then along the Mississippi River. But those populations are, are quite ephemeral and, and constantly moving. So I mentioned the first one, uh, yeah, here I have it right, Cisnolidia trifasciata ascendens. Um, this is the, the, um, the guide as it, it's printed in the, um, the Target Beetles of the United States and Canada by, uh, by David Pearson et al. And you can see that there's quite a few records of this species um, being found much further north of its, uh, of its um, uh, known range. Um, I think this, this distribution up through uh, the South Central US here is a little bit um, optimistic. Uh, this individual here is essentially the only individual that, that's ever been found in Missouri. Uh, Chris and I found it along the uh, one of the rivers, small spring fed rivers in the Ozarks in southeastern uh, Missouri. And um, we, we, we noticed it right away when we saw it, we were looking for, for other things there and, and uh, took photographs of it and, and collected it. And, and uh, so we were, it was interesting that it turned out to be um, this species, but um, we've never found any evidence. We didn't see any other individuals at that time. We've been to that spot. Uh, a number of times, and, and we've been to many other spots across Southern Missouri and have not seen this. So given the, its ability to disperse and, and, and end up as these uh, vagrant individuals in, in other areas, we've, um, we conclude that it's, it's not established in the state, uh, that it's represented only by, by a vagrant population. This is uh, an individual that I photographed down in Florida that shows the more typical appearance and um, it's pretty distinctive with this S-shaped um, uh, middle band. This is one of my favorite tiger beetles. Um, I'm going to talk quite a bit about this one because this is really an interesting situation. The, the, the prairie tiger beetle, so Cisindelidia obsoleta vulturina. It's a very large tiger beetle. It's more common in the Southwest, uh, but we do have this disjunct population down in Southwest Missouri. So here's the, the map from the, from the tiger beetle guide. And this shows the range of the, of the main species. There are a number of described subspecies, but we have this, this small disjunct population here. And uh, it, again, it's, it's a very large species. Only the tetrachas um, are larger than that. And um, uh, this is one of those species that really prefers the, uh, the glades and that are common in this, in this region. Uh, I think it represents a, uh, a hypsothermic relic. So probably about 5,000 years ago, uh, conditions were quite a bit warmer in the United States and the tall grass prairies extended uh, as far east as Ohio. And then since that time, uh, conditions have gradually gotten cooler and the, the, um, the grasslands have retreated to the west and, and the forest uh, expanded from the east. But in this part of Missouri and Northern Arkansas, uh, it's, not, it's not really um, deep forest. There's, it's a real mosaic of grassland and forest with the grasslands occupying these so-called glades, which are exposures of sandstone and dolomite um, that so, and, and, and especially with, with, with fire frequency, prior to uh, European settlement that, that kind of eliminates woody vegetation from these areas, it, it provided, um, uh, it still provides um, sanctuary for these 
grassland species. And, and so this is one of them. And um, it has a number of differences from the main population, um, uh, not only in its appearance, but in biology. It's a, it's a fall species. Uh, it comes out after the late summer rains and it actually does mate during the fall, which is, which is quite a bit different from the so-called uh, spring fall species, uh, as well as the, the main population further west, which seems to be more of a summer species. Here's one of those, uh, well, here's the, the typical population and uh, I snuck a, an Oklahoma picture in here. This is from Western Oklahoma, but you know, these, these beetles are mostly black and they have um, uh, kind of an incomplete pattern of uh, maculations. And, and the appearance is pretty uniform throughout the range of this, uh, of this species within its main distribution. But uh, in Missouri, so here are these, here's this glade. Uh, we call them glades, but technically they're, they're called Zurich limestone prairies or Zurich dolomite prairies. Uh, a true glade um, is, not, um, is not fire mediated. So these glades in Missouri, they require uh, periodic fire. You can see uh, Eastern red cedar um, will tend to colonize these, these areas. And we've lost a lot of glades from from woody encroachment, but um, uh, which uh, which obviously makes the habitat not quite so good for uh, for the tiger beetles when they close up. Uh, just a closer look at the uh, at the the dolomite substrate that we find here. It has a very characteristic look. Uh, it's with all the the surveying that we've done in this area, we got to where we could just even look out and say, "Oh, that looks like a good spot." Just based on knowing whether it was this uh, this particular um, stratum of dolomite exposed and the and the characteristic color of the rock and the and the lichens and the staining that, that gives it a uh, a characteristic appearance. So here's one of the um, individuals from Missouri, and the first thing you'll notice is that it's it's quite a bit more green than the main population, and most of the individuals. In Missouri, have some degree of green, but the but the Missouri population, it's really variable, not only in its color but in its in its degree of maculation. This one here, this one's beautiful. It, it almost has a, a cinnamon brown coloration, and you can see different patterns of incompleteness in the maculations. Like this one, the marginal band is almost complete, and there's but there's almost nothing on the on the elytra. Here's another one. Uh, so so kind of more the typical green that we see, but the maculations are, are highly reduced. And then an, another more, more of a cinnamon brown one, um, the, um, some of the bands are, are more uh, complete, but the, in this case, it's kind of the opposite of the one we looked at earlier where the marginal band is almost completely missing, but the, the, um, the dorsal markings uh, are much more well-developed. So this is, uh, this is basically the only place in Missouri where these beetles occur. And, uh, but, you know, the, the, the blade habitat in there, that area is quite extensive. The beetles uh, are, are consistently found there. And so we don't have any concerns about the status of the beetle in Missouri or the need to, um, to, to manage for it other than typical blade management. Um, tools such as uh, prescribed burns and uh, you know doing doing what we can to to uh, reduce encroachment of woody vegetation um, I don't know how many of you know Steve Spomer um, he's quite the tiger beetle guy he's from Nebraska and uh, so he he came out and uh, and uh, I showed him some of my spots in this area so that he could uh, see them for himself because it's really quite a, a unique population. And I, if you saw on the map, that little tongue of the, of the disjunct population extends down into north central Arkansas. And I did go down there and take a look at that. And, and I'm glad I did because uh, it's, it's quite different there as well. So again, you find them on glades, but in this case, these are, are sandstone glades. Uh, I, you know, and I should say Zurich stands, sandstone prairies. Um, but uh, again, it's it's a it's a it's a treeless habitat, and uh, 
more of a beetle's eye view of the of the habitat that shows what they're what they're seeing from their their point of view. I kind of like to take these shots uh, as well when I go to a habitat. But here's here's one of those individuals, and um, I think in this case I saw a little. I got more clues about uh, about this coloration that we're seeing. This one, this individual, it's you know it's in a nice patch of lichens and moss, which are quite abundant on the rock surface. And uh, it, it looks to me like like this coloration uh, works pretty well to to serve a crypsis function. And uh, you know, when you get the beetle in a situation where there's a lot more contrast with the background, you can you can really see uh, how that 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 crypsis works. Um, again, but the but the same shuffling of characters is going on there as well. And I don't think there's any separation between the Arkansas populations and and the uh, the southwestern Missouri ones. There's there are probably some connecting habitats that are allowing gene flow uh, throughout that disjunct um, zone. Uh, an almost blackish looking female here, uh, almost, you know, fairly complete maculations. So, um, and here's a, here's a mating pair. Uh, this is kind of the typical tiger beetle mate. It's actually mate guarding. It's not, you know, they're not, copulation's not, actually taking place it probably already has and he's just preventing any other males from from mating with her because in in, in most of these beetles and other insects it's the last male that mates with a female who whose sperm ends up fertilizing the bulk of the eggs but i have a i have a hypothesis about about this coloration that we're seeing and i i think you know i mentioned before i think this is a hips hypsothermal relic and so it's a relatively young population that's been, it hasn't been isolated from the main population for very long. And I think, you know, over the past 5,000 years, this has been a changing situation for them. It's not been static for, for 50,000 years. And I think there's, there's just some real sorting of genes going on that depending on local conditions and the, the local appearance of the rock and the, and the lichens and and, and what works best for Crips is that, that these maculations and the ground color, you know, they haven't really settled yet to, to give them a uniform look. And um, it's kind of an interesting situation. I don't, I don't have to think th further about how we go about um, studying that, but um, the, it's the best hypothesis that I can offer at this point as to why these beetles are so variable within a small, portion, disjunct portion of its range like this when the main population is so so uniform. Um, this is a, a bit of a sadder story uh, for Missouri tiger beetles. This is the, uh, we call this the saline spring tiger beetle because it, it's, um, it's restricted to saline springs in, east, in, uh, in central Missouri. And unfortunately these saline springs have been um, rapidly degraded in the last 50 years or so. And, um, uh, you know, all at the hand of man and, and, and his animals. And so um, it's not a very good situation for this beetle. Um, the, you know, when, I, when you talk about habitat specificity, this, this one probably uh, serves as an extreme example, but you can see where we found it both uh, in our surveys and from historical records within the state, and then how that disjunct zone compares with the main population further west, which is secure. So there's no problems with that. The, the, the thing about this Missouri population is that all of the individuals are blue. Now in the main population, you see a, a mix of blue and, and copper and green and red, uh, with blue being very rare. And uh, so it's kind of the opposite situation that we saw with the prairie tiger beetle in that the disjunct population is quite uniform in appearance, whereas the main population shows quite a bit of variability. So, and here's one of the, uh, just a, a picture of the habitat that, uh, around those saline springs, but you know, obviously the, the ground around these springs is quite alkaline and, um, uh, and, they, and they need that salinity. So, this is looking at, at, at our 
our deeper survey, and you can see we've got this box in the in the central part of the state here, which represents this larger map here. And and what this map shows is basically the results of, of this intense survey where we, we used um, historical records. Uh, we, were, we worked with conservation um, officials to determine the locations of any saline springs in the area, both those in public ownership and, and private. And essentially what we found was, um, uh, so these, these stars represent all of the saline springs known from this area. Mm -hmm. And uh, the red, you can see there's only two red stars. Those were the only spots during our survey where we actually saw the beetles. These yellow stars here represent historical records, but we did not see them during our survey. And in most cases, those habitats were highly degraded and determined, deemed uh, incapable of even supporting the beetle. And then we have these, these black stars as well, where the beetle had never been recorded. We didn't find it during our survey. And again, in, in, in all of these cases, the, the habitat was quite degraded and, and we deemed it not capable of, of supporting uh, a population. So you can see that we're down to, 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 to a scarce um, uh, amount of available habitat to support this beetle. And here's a look at some of those, those habitats. Um, this is one of the one of the, the two that we did see the beetles at, that was a, actually a new locality. It wasn't known before. Uh, and then this is the other one where we did see it. Uh, it was a historical locality as well, but you can see what's going on here um, with all the cattle there and the trampling going on and, and urine and ammonia and everything is not good for these beetles. And so we, we did not see many. Uh, at that location, and we did not see many here. But, but what happened in the future was was really distressing because um, there were some earth moving activities that went on at that new locality that we found that permanently permanently flooded the uh, the habitat for this beetle. And uh, this was uh, probably about 15 years ago now, and we've not seen the beetle since. So. Our, our, our feeling at this time is that this, this beetle, unfortunately, has been completely extirpated from the state, which is really a shame, not because we, only because we just don't, we don't have the species represented in the state, but we, we really feel that this disjunct population may have represented a distinct taxon, uh, either subspecifically, uh, certainly subspecifically, and maybe, uh, maybe at the species level, um, and, uh, you know, extinction is forever. So, um, we still, we still try to find it, but it hasn't looked good lately. So on to happier stories. This is the ant-like tiger beetle. Uh, this is, this is one of our two smallest tiger beetles in the state. So we've, we've gone from the, from the biggest to the smallest. And, um, you know, these common names, uh, I think common names are silly often, but in this case, ant-like tiger beetles, uh, it, it's really an appropriate common name. If you don't really know what you're looking for, it's, it's so easy to just not even see these things because you don't realize that they're, that they're tiger beetles. But this was an interesting um, story that came about. So uh, while when I, got, when I first got into doing this, we, um, the only specimen from Missouri known was a single specimen in the um, University of Missouri at Columbia collection. And it was simply labeled near Portageville. And uh, so I and we, Chris and I spent quite a bit of time down around Portageville. And in our thinking, you know, tiger beetles, they like, and, and, and even in the literature for this species, they like uh, open areas, you know, they like, uh, um, and, you know, this one being down in, in the boot hill, we figured, you know, it probably is near water's edge in Nebraska, it's described from wet meadows. So we're checking out all of the, these habitats and we just, we never see it. And until in 2007, a fellow by the name of Kent Fothergill uh, sent me an email one day and said, uh, hey, is this one of the, the beetles that you're interested in? And uh, of course I couldn't, couldn't believe that that he actually found it. But what he 
where he found it was was not out in the open, but inside the forest. And uh, as we would eventually find out, it, it's occupying the, the, the bottomland forests that line the big rivers down in that area, the Missouri and uh, the Mississippi River on one side and the St. Francis River on the other. And so, you know, we started surveying for this beetle and um, uh, ended up looking at a lot of, of sites where we thought this beetle might occur. And, and you can see that, that, that we found a number of sites and most of these were, actually all of them were, you know, were new spots because we just had the one specimen that we knew about. You know, a lot of, a lot of sites where we didn't, didn't find it, but still where we did, wherever we did find the beetle, it was, uh, it, it was, it was, the, the numbers were good. And so that, that gave us a lot of confidence in the, um, uh, that the status of this beetle in Missouri was secure. And of course, this is a copy of the title page of the, of the, the publication of those results. And uh, just some, some pictures, different pictures of the beetles from, from throughout that region. Um, they do have some very, uh, some variation in their, their appearance, but, but uniformly, consistently, they're very small. They run very fast. They do not fly. Uh, they do have wings, but they just um, choose not to fly. And um, uh, it, it's, it's quite a thrill the first time you see one and figure out that that's what you're looking at. Um, and, and quite difficult to, to catch too. This is what their, their preferred habitat looks like. I call this, um, I, I say that they like uh, forest, bottomland forests with radical understory. And that's because pretty often the, the understory in these bottomland, these wet bottomland forests was just rank with trumpet, trumpet, keep, trumpet creeper, which is Campsus radicans, and poison ivy, which is Toxicodendron radicans. You know, so, but um, oftentimes we, we would see this ridge and swale topography with, with, with uh, slight elevations of the sand that formed these kind of drier, drier, sandier um, patches within the forest, and then moister, more clay um, swales in between. And, and you would find them on these on these uh, these drier sandy swales within the forest, but but never out in the sun. Always with inside the forest. Here's an individual from right across the river, the St. Francis River into Arkansas. I went there to to see what that population looked like, and it was it was um, they were quite prolific there, and so um, gave me a lot more confidence about. It's, uh, it's status in Missouri, but uh, uh, these guys are fun to, fun to look at, especially up close. And uh, I'd hate to be an ant. Okay, so moving on to um, Dromochorus pruinina. This is the common name is the frosted target beetle. Um, this is another interesting story. Um, so uh, there's, a, there's a small series of specimens in the uh, University of Missouri collection. And uh, we use the collection data on those specimens to try to find this population. Uh, and, and we never succeeded in finding it, but not only did we not succeed in finding it, we just <laughs> didn't look right. It just didn't look like a right spot. You know, these, these beetles, at least for, from what we know further west, they like open clay and, uh, and we, just, we weren't seeing anything. And uh, until one day, um, Chris Brown got the idea, I wonder if instead of, because the label said 10 miles east of Warrensburg. And he said, I wonder what it looks like 10 miles west of Warrensburg. And that put him right on the Southern border of Nobnoster State Park with a long roadway that has these open patches of clay all along that roadside. And that's where he found the beetle. And so immediately we sprang into action and uh, uh, this, is what that, this is what the habitat looks like. It's kind of hard to, to see that that's good beetle habitat, but when you get past this grass, kind of up right along the edge of the forest, 
you can see these 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 exposed clay here and there's one of the beetles but uh and this is uh these are the the pages from chris's journal talking about the discovery i mean the, you know we get quite emotional about about these things especially it's something we've been looking for for a long time and and we finally found it but you know he talks about um uh being worried that he was going to be, again be spinning his wheels and uh and when he found it he hadn't even brought a vial uh but up here at, at the top is uh he said oh persistence is the thing you got to have and that's something that i've always told him whenever we're out and things aren't looking good um because i've learned over my lifetime that uh when you don't find something at first that doesn't mean it's not there it just means that you haven't found it yet so <laughs> Uh, we've learned to, uh, to, to always sing that, that little ditty when we're out and it gives us a little bit, bit of extra motivation. And I think that's probably what helped him, uh, at last find this species in Missouri. So, um, just a couple of shots of, of, of this beetle in it, in its habitat in Missouri. But again, this, um, this led to, uh, a more detailed survey, uh, using pitfall traps along with our our, our visual searches. Um, again, here's the, the area within Missouri where that those locations are confined to. And this map, all you see all the stars and everything, that those are all the locations where we where we visited and set traps. The black means we never found anything there. The red means we did. So you can see the, the square around it there. And that, that's the only place where we found these beetles. And so that's the stretch of road along the south edge of Knob Noster State Park. And at this point, the population seems secure there. So we went back in 2018 with some conservation officials, state conservation officials, uh, just to check on it and see um, if it's okay. And you can see, uh, that's me looking at some of the barren sand, uh, barren clay. So we, we, we did find the beetle there, but there are threats. You know, this is teasel and it's, it's taking over the roadsides. Uh, this is uh, Sericea, uh, Lespedisa, um, and again, they, they, you know, those are, uh, if those establish in the habitat, that could be bad news for the beetle, uh, and the, for the forest as well. Um, Knob Noster State Park is a forested park, but historically, it probably was much more open uh, due to fire, uh, more of a post oak woodland, and so we've been encouraging um, the, the state park um, personnel to implement management um, uh, regimes that would help open up that forest um, you know with the with the with the top priority to be uh, ensuring the survival of the beetles along this stretch of road but you know with a further goal to to open up that forest make more uh, clay patches available to to be colonized and 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 uh, and help expand the, the, the range of that beetle in the state so now we're going to move up to northwestern Missouri, where um, where we found this was another one of our holy grails. We always thought Cisindella uh, cylindra celeropes, the swift tiger, tiger beetle, uh, should be found in Missouri. We've had um, tiger beetle hunters from over the years go up there looking for it because it's it's known historically from areas in in Iowa and uh, eastern Kansas. Uh, but nobody ever found it. And then um, this is what the uh, what that range looks like. Uh, all these different colors mean different things, but this is basically uh, all of the locations. whether it should, uh, you know, whether it was a candidate for listing on the U.S. Um, endangered species list. And, um, and especially if you take out all these, all these blue here and the blue here, which means that we've seen it within the past 20 years, that just leaves this one spot here. And when, until we got started on this, hmm. that was the extent of its known um, occurrence. All of those red um, counties, those were locations where it had, it had not been seen in 100 years. Um, green and orange were a little bit more recent, but still not within the past 
20 years. So there was a lot of concern about this beetle. And uh, we got a break in 2008 when somebody in uh, Nebraska discovered this species at Hitchcock um, Preserve in southwestern Iowa. So, so this is the, uh, the, the western edge of Iowa along the Missouri River is, is what, are, what are known as the Lust Hills. And that um, geophysical um, landform extends just down into Missouri. And that's the southern terminus of that landform. And that's where we've been looking for this species. So they went there based on historical records and then they, they actually found this species there. So we wanted to go there to see the beetle for ourselves so that one, we could get, uh, we could get an idea of what we were supposed to be looking for in the field, what the beetle looked like, how it moved, what the habitat that it was um, occurring in. And um, so we went up to Hitchcock and uh, and looked for it there. It's a it's a it's a large preserve. It has really high quality uh, Lus Hilltop Prairie there. And for 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 about 20 years prior to our visit, they had been um, eliminating woody encroachment, uh, both mechanically and uh, and with prescribed burns. And, uh, and so this is where we actually ended up finding the beetle in these um, this, these little cuts, clay cuts here not so much on the slopes, but, but in, the, in the flat areas. But just some of my thoughts, when I first saw that, I, I said, that's tiger beetle land down there. I just had a feeling about it. And then walking down in that patch, uh, you know, you think you see something, wait, was that just a spider? Um, then you see a, another flash and you get it. And, and uh, it's quite, quite a thrill. Uh, so these, these were some of the first individuals that, that we collected there. I brought them back. Um, one of them actually laid an egg. Uh, I don't think it's in this picture. Maybe the next one. Right here it is. Actually laid an egg there in the in the terrarium of, of soil. So just some thoughts that you know the excitement of, of of the time. But anyway, so now we had a good idea what we were looking for, and uh, and we we took those learnings to the southern terminus of the Lust Hill Prairie in northwest Missouri and uh, used a number of tools, Google Maps, um, conservation agents, uh, to identify the um, suitable habitats there. And, and Lust Hilltop Prairie is an extremely rare habitat in Missouri. It's, it's, it's a threatened community. There are only about 50 acres left. Only about half of those are, are in, uh, under conservation management. And so, um, you know, because there, there aren't very many, we were able to actually visit all of them, and um, these were these are essentially the three places where we did find them. These are the three largest examples of this type of habitat in Missouri. They're all under public ownership and being managed to uh, to preserve this habitat, and so that that gives us a little bit of comfort. Uh, but again, the the these three spots represent about half. Of the 25 acres of, of the 50 acres that are that are still um, left, and um, the rest of it looks more like this. You can see the woody encroachment. This is a um, a private um, uh, a hilltop prairie on private property. Um, uh, of course, it hasn't seen fire for for quite a while, and uh, none of our none of our searches on these unmanaged spots were, were successful. So we're a little bit concerned about this one. Um, every time we go up and look for it, we do find it, but we never see big numbers. And these three sites where we have found it are, are quite disjunct from each other. Uh, you know, again, this is a flightless species, uh, so it can't disperse easily um, between these different areas. And uh, so, you know, the surrounding forest and agricultural lands can be considered hostile, hostile uh, habitat that, that can't be crossed. So again, we're working with um, conservation officials to implement um, management practices to one, preserve what is there and two, hopefully expand the, uh, the available habitat to further 
ensure the, the, the persistence of this beetle within the state. Um, and this, you know, finding this species in Missouri, so that gave us a lot more hope about the, the overall status of the beetle. And that kind of led us into some additional studies out west where we started looking at the population of the species as a whole. And uh, you saw those blue records in, in Western Oklahoma, that was a result of that. Um, and it all started with this one photograph that was on, on bug guide. And um, when we did, when, we, when, when we were able to visit alabaster caverns, we did find the beetle. We found the habitat that was living on and we were able to use that information and, uh, and document a number of different locations for the beetle out there where it is, where the habitat is extensive and, and all connected. The beetles are quite abundant um, throughout that habitat. And so we have, we have much less concern about this species as a whole now. I'm still concerned about it in Missouri and even in, in Southwestern Iowa, but, but as a whole, I don't think we have to worry about losing uh, the species. Just some pictures of what that habitat looked like. Again, you see, you know, there's there's quite a bit of open ground there. Um, this and again, this 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 lichen colonization of the of the substrate seems to be important. Um, I don't know if it's because of some physical property that it imparts in the environment, or if it's you know the 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 availability of prey that's that's utilizing that habitat. That, that contributes. Um, this is another spot that we found, the, the Glass Mountains in, in Northwestern Oklahoma, where the beetle was quite well established with, with lots of good habitat. Um, a really unique place, they have these, these, um, these uh, uh, gypsum hills, um, red clay hills with, the, with a cap layer of gypsum that, uh, that makes these unique landforms. And, uh, and the beetles are, are well established on, on the tops of all these, these little mesas. And they, they, they utilize these open areas between the clumps of vegetation. And, um, and finding this beetle in numbers there, so it allowed me to get a little bit more into uh, looking at the, at the larvae and its life history. And, um, you know, it, it turns out that, that the, the larva of this species is still uh, not formally described. And so I've been working on, on getting um, examples, of, uh, examples of the different larval instars. Uh, that's the burrow. That's, that's, a, um, that's a third instar, which is the, the final instar. It's only about uh, four, mil four millimeters diameter, so, so quite small. And uh, that's, that's the larva, the mature larva. Uh, all tiger beetles have these, these humps on their fifth abdominal segment that allow them to brace themselves into their burrow and avoid being pulled out by struggling prey. Uh, but the, the pattern of CD and, and hooks and, and the shape is, uh, is, it tends to be quite diagnostic, diagnostic for all species. So it, it enables some um, larval identification. And uh, these are the uh, containers that I used to rear this species. I would um, I confine adults in here and, and the, with native soil, tried to do what I could to, to keep the soil as intact as possible with the, with the, um, the, the natural surface. And uh, they laid eggs and, and established in these quite readily. I worked in an, uh, near an insectary, so I had a ready, ready, readily available supply of, uh, of small caterpillars to feed them. Uh, however, and often, however often they needed. These are two third instars um, sitting at the tops of their burrows waiting, waiting for their fall armorworm larva. And this is the, uh, the first adult that I reared completely from, from egg. And uh, so the, fir the, first, um, the first rearing of this successful rearing of this species. And uh, this- Ted, could, could you go back to the larvae picture, if you don't mind? Sure. So this where the, the jaws are down in that one there. Oh, so yeah. The, these are kind of otherworldly looking creatures. Um, here are the jaws right kidding. here. And, uh, and they have four eyes. So they have two eyes on each side. And, 
well, all the better to see you with, my dear. <laughs> They're visual predators. They wait for something that comes within striking range. They sit in their burrow. Um, oops. And 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 so they, you know, that that they have that flat head. Here are the jaws spread open right here, and there are two sets, two sets of eyes, two here and two here. And when they see something that gets close enough, they lurch out and grab it with their jaws, use that hook to keep from being pulled out and, and, and just crawl down the burrow and, and drag it down there. Are the jaws visible in these images here? In this image right here, I don't see the jaws. jaws. are visible, they're, they're hard to see, but here's, here's a jaw right here, and here's uh, one right here. Okay, I see now, yeah. yeah. And then if you look at the, uh, oops. Thank you. Okay, there we go. Now in this picture, those, those jaws are closed. When they're sitting at the top of their burrow, they would have them spread wide open. Okay. So, and there, here's the paper that resulted from, from those studies. So we, we wrote that all up to give a comprehensive look at, at the species and um, uh, w along with our, our recommendations for conservation um, practices to be used in the different areas where the species occurs. This was in the Coleopterus Bulletin uh, a few years ago. And then finally, we get to the ghost tiger beetle. This, this is an amazing species. The first time you see it, you just can't, the, the coloration is just so marvelous. And, you know, they're mostly white. That's why they have the common name, ghost, ghost tiger beetle. Um, but this was, uh, this was one that, um, okay, so, you know, you go out and you look in the sand and where is the beetle? Where is it? And then you, and then you see it. There it is right there. Sitting there plain as day, but until it moves, you have no idea something's there. And then even when it does move, if, if it moves and then stops, it's like, wait, did I see something? So yeah, really a fun um, species to go out and look for. Um, again, you know, that, that, that really charismatic face. It's, I just enjoy, really enjoy taking portraits of, uh, of the different species. Um, so we have, you know, we have quite a few records from Missouri. I don't think we're really too concerned about its persistence here, but what makes it, what, what gives us cause for concern is the, is the, um, the, the, the habitats are so ephemeral because it really needs this freshly dumped deep dry sand that forms along the big rivers. And because all of these rivers have been channelized, uh, the frequency of those floods that can do that is reduced. And then when they do happen, they're, they're way bigger, way more catastrophic and tend to, to do great big dumps. So instead of a of kind of a, a constantly shifting mosaic of small sandbars moving up and down the rivers, you have a much more static situation where big uh, habitats are created and then they sit and they degrade over a period of 20 years until they're gone. And then you get another big event that creates a big patch somewhere else. And so that, that gives us some concern. Um, but this is an example of that. So this was um, habitat that was created in, the, in a big flood that we had here in 1993. And it was within about uh, five to seven years after that, that we started that we first saw colonization by these beetles. And these, um, these images from Google show at different dates, show that. So, you know, this is, uh, this is just a couple of years after the flood and you can see how extensive that those sand plains are uh, along the M Missouri River. But, but going through the years, 2004, 2006, 2009, 2011, you can see how that's all closing in, that's all, um, cottonwood trees that establish in those those sandbars and and gradually encroach and, and close up that that um, that habitat and so those habitats don't persist uh, there's not really anything that we could do other than um, uh, try to try to um, 
create a little bit more um, temporary habitat by maybe, um, I don't think it's possible to unchannelize the Missouri River, but um, there are, are a number of um, wildlife refuges that have been created up and down the river where at least they're not, uh, you know, it's not agricultural land and they can do some management to, uh, to keep open sand in the area. So here's another area that was, uh, that's that same area, um, Darce Bottoms. Uh, this is what it looked like in 2011. This is just a few years later. The beetles are still present, uh, but not as much. Um, I was last there maybe two years ago and I found uh, just one carcass and that was it. But, you know, new habitats are created at the time that, that old ones are disappearing. And so here's another huge, I mean, you can just see how extensive this is. There's me for scale. Um, this habitat was created in 2015, uh, a flood in 2015. We went there, we visited, um, or actually we visited in 2015. It was created um, uh, just a couple of years earlier. So we did find one beetle in all of our searches there. So, so you know, the beetles are, had found it, not really, maybe not really fully utilizing it yet. Probably by now we might see better numbers. But again, this, this habitat has a life cycle and, and it will come and go. I just wanted to finish up on a little more of a lighthearted note, you know. So I've shown you a lot of photographs and, um, uh, uh, you know, I'm my own worst critic. And so I, I see everything I did wrong with those photos, but, um, but I can appreciate that, that for the most part, they do give a pretty good look at, at these beetles. But, you know, there was a lot of learning that, that came along with that, 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 that resulted in that. And uh, this is Chris Brown. So he's, he's been my partner and he was also, he was also my, my photography um, uh, mentor. So I didn't actually pick up photography until I started studying tiger beetles. And so for me, they were kind of like what I learned on. And, uh, and of course, you know, the pictures that I, that I took earlier, uh, I see everything I did wrong and wish I could do better. But um, you know, this is, these are examples of when things really go wrong. And, and for, uh, photographing tiger beetles out in the field really is a challenge, but it's one of those fun things where, where um, you know, there, there are ways to do it. And you do learn how to approach them and, uh, and, and, and get the shots that you want, but, but it's not easy. And that's, that's probably why, why it is fun. If it was easy, everybody would be doing it. You know, but um, when we first were doing this, we were like, Ah, we'll just catch them and, and bring them home and we'll put them up, you know, we'll set them up in a, in a little terrarium and take pictures. Well, and, and, and they're so, they're too active. So let's just chill them down um, to get them to not move so much. And this is what you end up with now. So, so as a, as an intact photographer, especially one who, who kind of thrives on, on photographing insects in their environment, live and, and, and unrestrained, this is, this is horrible. This, this poor tiger beetle, he's torpid. He's laying flat on the sand. His legs are kind of splayed out and his antennae dropping in, in, in an unnatural pose. And while this shows the beetle very well, it's from my perspective, it's, all, it's a horrible photo. So we learned really quickly that, well, we can't just do that. So um, we, used our, we used our knowledge and, and figured out how to get these good photographs out in the field um, that show them not only what the beetle looks like, but the behavior that goes along with it. This is a, this is a, um, a big sand tiger beetle, Cisandella formosa, uh, we, the subspecies of generosa out here. Um, but they like these hot sand habitats. And uh, this one's exhibit, exhibiting um, stilting, standing, standing up tall on its legs to, to raise its body above the, uh, there's a thin layer of super hot air right on top of that sand. And um, just one example of the thermal regulatory behaviors that they, that they exhibit. Um, you know, and so just getting, getting them to act right is, is only part of the battle. There's also um, lighting, um, especially in our, in our setup shots. And uh, you can see this, 
you know, when, when we first started doing the flash photography, um, the, you, we, the, the lighting was really harsh and we got these specular highlights on the eyes. Um, the, the double one here is, you know, you can, you can reverse engineer that and know exactly what, what, uh, what kind of flash unit was used and how it was positioned and everything. Um, and we eventually learned how to use diffusers and, uh, like inside, we can use a white box. Uh, but even out in the field, we use make much more use of diffusers and everything to get much more even lighting, um, give a much more pleasing look to that beetle, eliminate the highlights and uh, the strong, the strong shininess on the on the on the elytra and a better look at the colors. And uh, and you know we you can you can set these up in white boxes and and get some pretty dramatic photos. Uh, not really so good for showing it out in the field, but, but uh, um, quite dramatic nonetheless. So I'm just gonna close out kind of with a, with, with a plea related to something that I started out with, and that's the citizen scientist um, aspect of this, this work. Again, you know, I, I'm a professional entomologist. I was always a professional entomologist, but I never was a professional tiger beetle guy. I did that just purely out of avocation and, and a, and a love of insects and you know a, a, a fun and interesting way to spend my free time and and uh, and we 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 made a really big contribution to the knowledge of these beetles especially in Missouri and and even outside of Missouri the you know the overall um, status of these beetles and and what needs to be done to ensure their their persistence and so it's um, you know and and other people are doing this I got. Um, I have this book here, Diary of a Citizen Scientist by, by Sharman Apt Russell um, out in Arizona. And she's, and she's also interested in tiger beetles, but she really puts in, in beautiful prose kind of the, the philosophy behind that and, and um, what a worthy endeavor that it is. And so it, it, you know, it's, it's just as much of a contribution as is made by, by the professional scientists. And, and, and actually there's kind of a codependence there. Um, the, the citizen scientists need the professionals for 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 mentorship and 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 uh, and and understanding what are the what are the avenues of study that they can make a contribution in and but the but the professionals need um, us amateurs as well because we they can't do everything there's just not funding there and um, and and there's this army out there of 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 willing and able participants that can that can help them uh, help contribute to this the overall knowledge base on on these beetles and um uh, finally on there you know i put bug guide and and, and i naturalist um i make big use of those um especially i naturalist um because of the the crowdsourcing aspect of that and and the 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 its usefulness as a data repository i use i naturalist all the time when I'm out in the field, not only loading up my own observations, but searching other observations and seeing where I might find this thing or that thing and, and what time and uh, and all that. So um, that's my presentation. If there's any time left, I'd be happy to answer any questions uh, if that's permitted. Okay. Thank you very Certainly. much, Ted. Hey, everybody. Yes, that was really good. The uh, images are fabulous. Uh, I have to say, among the best I've ever seen. So thank you for thank you. sharing. Yes. So does anybody have some questions? I have a question. Nobody else does, but I didn't want to interrupt if someone else has one. Um, this is Marsha. I have one. Ted, thank Hi, you for that. Hi. Hi, Ted. Thanks for that very interesting presentation. Um, I've never been to Missouri except flying through it. So I, I didn't know it was so beautiful. Your slides <laughs> really make me want to go there. Um, but I have a question. I'm intrigued by those saline springs. That is a habitat that I'm not at all familiar with. Can you tell us a little more about that, like where does the salt come from, for example? 
Uh, I don't know how much more I can tell you about them other than that they they seem to be restricted to that central part of Missouri. And these are, you know, the, the, there are lots of springs in Missouri. You know, we have karst geography with, um, especially in the Ozark Mountains. So there are more caves in Missouri than, uh, than any other state except for Kentucky, I believe. Um, these saline springs are, are a bit north of that. They're on the north side of the Missouri River. And, um, you know, presumably the, 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 the salt comes from underground, but I think it, rep you know, so saline springs are much more common as you get out into the Great Plains. And um, so I think that, you know, the, these saline springs are, are like just the eastern little tip of a larger system that occurs further west. And uh, so it's kind of similar to the beetles that inhabit them. You know, the, the, uh, that range that I gave for the species out in the Great Plains, you know, that's all around, those are all on um, alkaline sites. So wherever saline springs exist and they're quite common out west. Huh, I'll have to read some more about them. They really intrigue me. We don't yeah. have them in Maryland. <laughs> there's, some, there's some really good um, habitat in Kansas, uh, uh, Quivera National Wildlife Refuge is, uh, is a good place to see both the habitat and these beetles. Um, I can't recommend looking at the, the spots in Missouri because they, they're, they're, they've been almost degraded out of existence. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, unfortunately. Uh, that's a shame. Yeah. Thank you. As a follow-up to her question about the saline springs, do you know, Ted, if there's been any collection of uh, diptera from those sites? Because um, there's a couple of families that are found only in uh, these alkaline or saline environments. Well, I would imagine so. Those specimens would probably be in the University of Missouri collection. So, so one of those sites where these beetles were found, that was that was actually that was a pretty famous spot. So every student that was getting their master's in entomology at University of Missouri went to Boone's Lick to get this tiger beetle. And you could go there reliably, and the beetles were quite abundant. The habitat was very extensive. So I would imagine those weren't the only insects that were collected. Um, I doubt that, I doubt that they're there now, but, um, you know, you might contact the, uh, the curator there. Uh, I can provide contact information if you, if you need, that's, uh, Bob Seitz is the, the curator there and, and Chris Simpson is the, is the museum, uh, um, uh, collection manager. Yeah. Maybe they have a bunch of unsorted material. I'd love to go through it. So yeah. It's, that's Thank entirely you. possible. Thank you. Yeah. Are those sites where the saline springs are the only ones? Uh, I was wondering if that's all of them. That you guys seem to survey pretty thoroughly, but I don't know if is, are they just not very many altogether. Right. Those are all uh, of them. Yeah. Wow. That's uh, not good for the beetle. <laughs> yeah. Yes. Yeah, and in fact, the only two that were under public ownership are the two where we did find the beetle. Are the populations at those sites uh, fairly good? Are they robust enough to keep them going? They're gone. They're they, gone. They, they, oh. the one, one of the sites was, um, it was just a, a portion of the, ha the available habitat was on the public um, ground. And that site has been heavily encroached by, by vegetation. Uh, the bulk of that habitat was across the fence into pasture land and that's where all the cows were and then at the other site that's the site that um that was the new site that we discovered that was then um shortly thereafter they're flooded permanently okay so that's the one that was extirpated totally from missouri now yes okay just want to make sure <laughs> yeah unfortunately and you know it's one of the most beautiful ones as well. Yeah, it is. It's really neat. Yeah. Anybody else have some questions? Please speak up. I had one quick question. You mentioned the ant-like tiger beetle, I believe you said was the smallest. Uh, what's the length of that? Uh, the adults oh, are, oh. the adults are probably, uh, let's see, six to eight millimeters. 
Yeah, six millimeters. Okay. Just over a quarter yeah. inch. Yeah, tiny, very tiny. Is the ghost tiger beetle blepta, is that related to our dorsalis over here and the, the other one, the Puritan tiger beetle that we have? I'm sorry, can you repeat that? You broke up a little bit. Yeah, the ghost tiger beetle? Yes, Ellipsoptera is that, lepida. Is that, yeah, lepida. We have dorsalis over here. It's a white tiger beetle and also an, um, I'm trying to remember the name of the other one. There's two of them that are quite rare that, in Maryland. And for yeah, those. That's so is a this a relation? Genus. No, it's that's a that's genus. a different genus. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So the white coloration is not not like a um a basal character or anything. It's it's a response to uh, the conditions that it that it lives in. So you'll see you'll see white tiger beetles throughout all of the different genera. Okay. Or typical cystine del deline types. There are some white species um, further west that are endemic to different sand dune systems out there. So there's there's a sand dune dune system in in northwestern Colorado, the Moffat system, and uh, um, I think you have Scutellaris there in Maryland. It wouldn't look like that, but there's a white subspecies in those dunes. Um, there's a different species that's almost pure white in the um, uh, the coral pink sand dunes of southwestern Utah. And in fact, that's the only place in the world where that species is, is known from. Um, that's one worth making a trip for to see. That place ought to be a national park. <clears throat> I did that in 91 with Barry Nisley. Yeah. It was wonderful. <laughs> yeah. You said this is a subspecies of Scutellaris and it's white? Yes. Wow, that's amazing. The one, the one in Colorado. Yeah. yeah, so Scutellaris, I didn't talk about Scutellaris. That's, that's an interesting story. Um, that is probably the most polytopic species of tiger beetle in North America. There is a, a number of subspecies have been described. They're all quite distinct from, from each other, uh, but it just really shows, goes to show you how, how plastic these, these characters are and, um, and how they evolve in, in connection with the environment, the local environment that they're, they're living in. I was just out in Utah this summer, but I didn't know anything about that beetle. Um, where exactly in the state is it? Way down in the southeast, uh, southwest corner, extreme corner. Um, okay. uh, Cedar so, City is, it's near Cedar City. Near Cedar City. Okay, going up towards oh. Zion and that direction. Yeah, I think it's, what's the name of the town right there? It begins with a K. With a K. I know St. George is down that way, um, but I'm not sure which one you mean, Ted. Yeah. I'll think of it after we're done here. Of course. <laughs> How about Splendida? Did, did we uh, see a picture of that one? I can't remember. You had a lot of beautiful pictures. Just in the, um, the one, the overview of all 24 species. Uh -huh. uh, so, so Splendida is, um, it's not, it's not uncommon, but it's still, you still have, it takes an effort to, to find it. It tends to be, it tends to occur mostly in the Ozark Highlands on clay two tracks, and then up in the Northwestern corner in the Lust Hills. And um, it's interesting because the, the, the population in the Lust Hills, uh, those tend to be completely maculated, while the ones in the Ozark Highlands are almost completely unmaculated. At one point, those were called a, a different subspecies, uh, transversa, but uh, there's really no genetic basis for that. 
Yeah, the so ones we get right. here are unmaculated, if, if I'm not mistaken. I've yeah, never so collected, but I, I've seen a few in the collections here and there. And yeah. they're also found on the, the clay banks that you describe. Yeah. Yeah, so that's a spring fall species. So they come out in, in the spring and they disappear over the, uh, uh, over the summer. And then, and then a new generation emerges in the fall. They come out and feed, but they don't mate. They're sexually immature. And then they they uh, they burrow back in for the winter, and then they they reemerge in the spring as sexually mature adults, and then that's when mating and oviposition takes place. And that's a typical example of the uh, of the spring fall life cycle. There's basically you know most species are either of the spring fall type or of the summer type, but then you see kind of um, variations on those themes, like with the prairie tiger beetle that large one that we have down in the Southwest, um, it's evolved a, a fall life cycle in response to local conditions there. That's pretty which complicated. Is, which is derived from the summer life cycle, not from the spring fall life cycle. Hmm. I have no idea, that's <laughs> pretty cool. Anybody else have anything they'd like to ask? Um, uh, I didn't have a question, but I did want to uh, at least offer a comment, and that was to uh, thank you very much for the presentation. These uh, these tiger beetles are really sort of showboat ambassadors for the whole uh, order of Coleoptera. Right. And they're uh, uh, always been a favorite of mine as well. Thank right. you. You're welcome. Thank you. It looks like we got a response in the chat box from Tim. Southwest of Peter City is St. George and Southeast is Canab, Janet. Canab, that's it, yeah. Canab, Canab. <laughs> Forgot to mention. Did you find a beetle, Warren? Oh, yeah. Everywhere I go, I find beetles. <laughs> if I don't, I, oh, I know that. I, I leave. But uh, <laughs> anyway, uh, thanks, Ted, for uh, superb picks and stories. Um, Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. Much appreciated. Mm. All right, everybody. Clap your hands, right? <laughs> there you go great great Reaction. presentation great photographs yeah thank you yeah thank you I, I love tiger beetles i collect them every now and then i put them in a vial look at them take a picture and let them go yeah <laughs> <laughs> well hopefully you'll look at them a little more closely now yeah yeah, I was amazed at the larvae. I have to say that was something like from a sci-fi movie. Yeah, one of the funnest things that I experienced with these larvae is um, uh, so there's different ways to extract them from their burrow. Um, one of the more common ones is called fishing, and uh, I never get tired of showing someone how to fish tiger beetle larvae when they see it for the first time because basically. <laughs> Uh, you know, you get a long grass stem, uh, you, you chew up one end of it to fray it a little bit, and you stick that down there and, and wiggle it around and they'll latch onto it. You can feel them kind of grab it like, like, like you're fishing and you, and you yank it out real quick and that tiger beetle will come flying out of the burrow and tumbling through the air and then and land on the ground and, and there it sits, the most otherworldly creature that looks like it came from Mars. And, and when somebody sees that for the first time, you know, they, they were taken by surprise by all of that, by the appearance of the larva, by the way it came flying out of the burrow, by the fact that you could even do something like that. So yeah, I, that's, that's one of my, that's my, one of my greatest joys is showing people how to fish tiger beetle larvae. <laughs> All right, well, um, I wanted to, um, if nobody has any questions or comments uh, on another note, I wanted to say something before we all 
start exiting from the meeting. Um, I recently received a request from a high school teacher who was looking for a science project for a high school student, something to do with entomology. I have not yet replied back, but if anybody has something that they think would make a good science project for a high schooler, um, please uh, shoot me an email and let me know if that's the case. I would, uh, I'll pass on that information happily. So, um, and I can put my email in the chat box if anybody wants to try to help with that, um, that would be highly appreciated. So, um, I'm getting a lot of hits all at once. Everybody's. <laughs> And this could be most any kind of thing, I believe, is what they're some some kind of little research project that a student can do. Well, Fred, is it? Um, huh? I guess it's probably something they want to do starting now and over the winter. Do you know the time frame? I think. I don't really know for sure. They may just are trying to gather information right now because obviously I think it would be uh, more suitable for the spring um, to do something. But, you know, if, if there's a project that can be done later, I mean, I can suggest things and say, here's some stuff to look forward to doing later on. I don't so, recall that there was, a, yeah. I, I, I can tell you that Sam Drogi is promoting people looking at what native plants bees are feeding on in gardens um, or you know in the field. Um, and bumblebees are the primary ones of interest because they're fairly easy to identify in the field. Mm -hmm. So like that's a really good high school kind of project. It's simple. It's, they would need to identify the plants, but actually with apps that are available these days, it becomes really easy. So, so what plants are these coming looking to? Looking at what native plants, yeah, what looking at what native plants are being used by bumblebees. Thank you, Marcia. Sam, full of ideas. Yeah, um, I could ask him too, for sure. Thank you. For that matter, it wouldn't have to be restricted to bees. It could be butterflies, moths, could be anything. Oh yeah. Well, this will give them a start and they can think of some things. Same. Brad, what part of the region is this high school teacher from? Um, I wanted to say Harford. I think mm -hmm. that's it's up there. Course so if, it, if, if it's Hartford County, um, I'll mention that the Hartford Bird Club has a really active education program with school age kids. And I'll bet they would have lots of ideas if somebody wanted to work with birds. But you had said they wanted entomology, right? Yeah. That's why they contacted me. Okay. But anyway, it doesn't hurt to even examine something like that. So I thought maybe this would be a good place to inquire of, make an inquiry of this nature. So thank you for your suggestions.
I put my email in the chat box in case anybody has another uh, wants to use or, or make contact with me. Yeah, I was saying, Fred, we're having terrible internet problems here with, with screens freezing and people talking. And I don't know if that's happening everywhere, but uh, you might want to call it a night here. Yeah, I think so. Yeah, that's fine. I think we've uh, given opportunity at this point for uh, questions and commentary and whatnot. So, um, if nobody has anything further, then uh, we can end the meeting. I want to thank Ted again for graciously uh, providing this nice lecture for us tonight in the superb photography. You guys must be very patient sitting there with the um, the um, camera to get those setup pictures. That there, I, I was wondering. You must get very close to them in order to do that, right? Yes. Oh, persistence is the thing you got to have. Yeah. <laughs> well, thanks again, Ted. And uh, you're welcome. And thank you for the invitation. My pleasure. Absolutely. And also, thank you for all your kind help that you've given uh, over time to uh, review journal articles for us and you know things like that. That's highly appreciated. And uh, you've given the uh, the articles a nice uh, extra boosts and professionalism that we highly appreciate. Again, my pleasure. To, yeah, thanks Thank a lot. Yep. All right. Okay. Well, hey, I guess I'll go you. end the meeting. Go ahead, Jean. Sorry. No, I was just saying thanks again to Ted. We appreciate you giving your presentation tonight. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, All right. great weekend. Good night. Good night. Good night. It was great seeing everybody on the Zoom meeting. Thank you all for attending. A shout out to Dr. Harold Harlan. Thanks for being here. Haven't seen you in a long time. Haven't seen any of you guys in a long time. <laughs> hey, Warren Steiner. How are you doing, buddy? Hey, uh, <laughs> still chasing flies. Yep. My old camping buddy in Cape Hatteras. Yeah, we we swung at him a lot of times. <laughs> Bloody tethynids and yep, what all? I'm getting ready to describe a new species, by the way, that you collected. Cool. Yep, I'll let you know more about it in the future. <laughs> well, I got enough vermin named after me, but uh, <laughs> it would be cool. Yep. <clears throat> Alrighty, well, uh, I guess buenos noches, everyone, and yep. Guten Abend. See you next month, maybe. <laughs> bye bye. Yes, hope everybody. to see people next month again. <laughs> bye bye. All right. <clears throat> see you, George. <clears throat> Gene, do we have any kind of business? I see Janet is here um, and Ed is here too. So maybe uh, should we do like a treasurer's report so Janet can take that down? I can stop recording too, by the way, so.